So let's welcome our third speaker of tonight, YB Liu Chintong, and also the chairman of REFSA. Recently, uh, we note or we read about section 124. How does the, the, the whole sentence frame? If it says that anything against Najib is uh, detrimental to parliamentary democracy. <laughs> and we are now at the time talking about no confidence, no confidence vote. We are talking about uh, a situation, a crisis situation. And perhaps we can ask ourselves a very serious question. Will there still be parliament by September, by October 19? Parliament is supposed to be supposed to resume on 19 of uh, 19 of October. Najib is not prepared to call emergency parliament to fill to fill the what they call the PAC. And the question now is: Will there still be parliament session uh, in October? And I want to quote someone. I want to to begin. I want to quote someone. He said, "Under previous BN governments." The opposition had always won seats in parliament and had beaten the BN in many states. Najib's lack of respect for the law and constitution and his willingness to buy politicians and civil servants may mean the end of parliamentary democracy in Malaysia. And I, I agree with him. I agree that the guy accepted that the, the guy is Dr. Mahathir. No, I actually, I agree with Mahathir that uh, there is a danger where the way Najib goes, the way he's, uh, he's moving, there's a question of whether there's still, there will still be parliamentary democracy. Because, you do, because Najib is, not, is afraid of calling, he's afraid of AMNO election. Najib is afraid of um, calling the, the Mazis Tatingi. Najib is, uh, is afraid of uh, calling emergency parliament, but the clock is ticking. At some point, there will be AMNO um, General Assembly. At some point, uh, parliament, parliament sitting will have to be called. And what, what is he afraid of? He's afraid of congregation of people who, who can remove him. He's afraid of uh, Majid Tatingi because uh, uh, the AMNO um, Supreme Council can remove him. The AMNO um, Supreme Council had removed uh, Anwar Ibrahim from from the party before and he's afraid of parliament because when MPs gathered there there are opportunity, there are possibilities when uh, for for MPs to cross the line or cross the bench and eventually re resulted in his removal. So I think he's afraid. So perhaps this is the time to talk about the uh, what sort of parliament we want beyond Najib. And hopefully more and more people understand that we need a different parliament. And as Rafizi pointed out, we are here because uh, we, we are now at this situation where we cannot remove Najib. We don't know how to remove Najib in many ways because of a dysfunctional parliamentary system. Now, we need major shift in our thinking. We need major shift in our thinking. We need to have a uh, we need to have a different sort of parliament and with a different philosophical basis. The current parliament is built for a one-party state. Now, we, we emulated the Westminster system. But actually, over the last six, 50 over years, the Westminster, the Westminster system itself has changed a lot. The British parliament has changed a lot. The British parliament is an evolving institution. It has changed, it has evolved on a daily basis. In fact, I visited uh, the British Parliament with not just like two years ago. We, we, we didn't know that actually what we talk about, uh, say, select committee or ministerial committee of British Parliament was only a feature introduced immediately after Margaret Thatcher took over, took over in 1979. Before 1979, there was no ministerial committee. But after 79, every ministry is supervised or overseen by a parliamentary committee. That's new. And that's and the evolving feature of British Parliament. But over the last uh, 56 years since 1959, since Parliament, Parliament convened 
in 1959, we are seeing a downward spiral. You are seeing a downward spiral, and of course, the latest is the attack on PAC by taking people out and put them, uh, dump them into the cabinet. So the cabinet becomes a garbage, garbage uh, dump. So we need, we need to think beyond the current structure. I think we need to think beyond. A, we need to think of a new situation where we are a 50-50 democracy. A 50-50 democracy means that you will have both sides in your society. You recognize that the society has both sides. You, you recognize that society has differences. And parliament is where you work out, the, work out compromises. We recognize in a democracy, it is about recognizing differences. It's about accommodating differences. It's about working out consensus. And I think that is important. So we have to go beyond the old thinking that this is a one-party state, uh, UMNO has its supremacy. I don't think the country will go back to pre-2008 unless there's no election, unless election is abolished. If there's still election, I think it will be a 50-50 situation where 50% of the population will vote for vote for BN, 50% of, of the population will vote for opposition. Either way, in many democracy, it's 55, 45, 58, uh, 42. You won't go to a situation where the ruling party will have 80% of the vote and uh, the opposition ha having only 20% of the vote. I think that won't happen uh, in, in the years and years and years to come. We will continue to be a 50-50 democracy with one side winning 55, uh, the other side winning 45. I think that is a reality that we have to recognize. Now, our parliament is wasting our youth, wasting our time. In many ways, uh, I agree with Rafizi. It's wasting our time. We sit there. Sometimes uh, after, this is my second term, I've been repeating the same thing in budget speech. Uh, in the same format, until one day I say, forget about it, I don't, I don't have to talk about it. For instance, I talk about reorganizing the police, reorganizing the police, reducing the number of special branch officers, reducing the number of uh, uh, police fuel force, fuel force or pasukan gerakan am, and moving them, for instance, moving the special branch officers to do investigation on crime moving the PGA, members of the PGA, PGA to do patrolling. I've been talking about that since 2008. Nothing changed. Until, until I feel that, I mean, I better write more rather than speak more in parliament. So we, we have to move away from, from a parliament that is not functional to one that is functioning and it's not just a theatre for Bung Mokta and Azalina. We need a parliament, and, but parliament, in any parliament, there, there will be some Theoretical, theoretical elements. Even in the Congress, you 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 speak, you will dramatize, uh, dramatize your views, and therefore we need parliamentary committees. You need the committees to work out compromises in a 50-50 democracy. And the importance of committee is is because we can't work out compromises in the theater because we have to speak and we have to be seen as uh, seen as heroes. But in committees. You can work out compromises and you have to work out consensus to govern in, and based on common sense. In, poly, in, in a normal democracy, I would say 80% of uh, governance are commonsensical. You, how to deal with the hospital, how to deal with healthcare system, how to deal with the transport system. It can be ideological, but in many ways it's also commonsensical. You have to work out details, work out compromises in the committee. And that is something that we should move away, move towards. Now we also have to move away from this presidential prime minister power. Our prime minister has more power, wielded more power than a US president. The US president is checked by the Congress. If the Congress doesn't like the US president, and especially when, when it is, the Congress is run by a different party, the Congress can shut down the presidential office. And it happened so many times in, in history. Here in, here in Malaysia, the Prime Minister can shut down Parliament easily. <laughs> so we should move to a si situation where we have strong cabinet, maybe not a big cabinet, 
but a cabinet with very strong leaders. But we also need parliament to have very strong leaders, to have very strong backbench. So I, I envisage a Malaysian parliament where the cabinet is strong, but small. You have a very strong committee system, chaired by very distinguished MPs who are not interested to serve in the cabinet. And we have to look at remuner remuneration for par uh, par parliamentary committee chairman. The chairman should be given more staff. I went to the US Congress and realized that US senator who chairs big committees like foreign affairs or defense committee, each of them having 100 staff. They have more staff than prime minister of many small country. US senator chairing a big committee. Now, can we actually provide parliamentary chair, parliamentary committees, uh, chairman, give them ministerial perks, or at least deputy ministerial perks, and strength, so that they don't, they don't rush into the cabinet like nobody business when the prime minister bribed them. And I think, I think we need strong committees, we need strong committee chairman, and we need strong uh, cabinet, but not a populated, not, not a crowded cabinet with too many ministers. And I think we also need to save the country from prime ministerial dictatorship. Second. Now the functions of parliament are the following. To elect the government. Now we are, we are following the Westminster system. and our, The function of parliament is to elect the government from among MPs and to scrutinize the government. Now this is the most important function. This is the most important function that the US Congress doesn't have. The most important function, and it is relevant now, very relevant now, because we have to decide whether to elect a new prime minister from among the MPs, and whether, as pointed out by Dr. Mahate, uh, how, to, how to strike a balance, because Mahate is trying to strike a balance. He knows that there's no other way. He has to now talk to the opposition. And now the question is whether the opposition wants to talk to him. And, uh, and he's telling the opposition that uh, if you don't talk to me uh, and I'm no MPs, you will have no, no election in, in the future. Uh, I mean, this remains to be seen. The second function of parliament is representative or expressive to voice out the, the, the views of the constituents. And of course, the third one is to make law. Now, unfortunately, we are in a parliamentary, uh, we're in a prime ministerial dictatorship where the prime minister controls everything and there's very little for the parliament or for every for others to play. No, no one has any roles to play. You can look at this uh, as pointed out by Anthony earlier. The parliament runs a budget of 89 million ringgit for 2015. The prime minister department runs a budget of 19 billion. And out of the 19 billion, 7 billion are something uh, are what what I call a slush fund. Uh, it's a, it's a terrible word, sir. Huh? Out of the 19 billion, 7 billion are discretional funds where the Prime Minister can sign off as he, wish, as, he, as he wishes. The rest are not necessarily discretional, he has to itemize it, but of the 19 billion, 7 billion are discretional funds that the Prime Minister can sign, sign off as he wishes. Now, I don't want to take up too much of your time because we can exchange uh, views later, but I just want to show you how dysfunctional the system is. When we talk about parliament parliamentary democracy, when we talk about parliamentary reform, uh, it is about what Anthony say, but it's also about the mindset, the, the mindset shift, and it's also about shifting away power from the Prime Minister Department back to the Ministry, by shifting away power from the Cabinet back to the parliament and by emphasizing the importance of parliament. I just want to show you how we ended up as a prime ministerial dictatorship or a presidential prime minister uh, cabinet. This is in the prime minister, this is in the, in the agencies in the prime minister department. Actually, I, think don't, I don't think we need the cabinet anymore. We actually don't need the cabinet anymore because uh, we have 11 ministers in the prime minister department uh, in addition, we also have the Prime Minister and uh, Deputy Prime Minister. So on top of the Deputy Prime Minister and the Prime Minister, we have 11 Ministers in Prime Minister Department. We also have uh, about 5 or 6 Prime Ministerial en Envoys. 
Prime Minister Ambassador to various places. Uh, we also have a Prime Minister wife. So these are the these are the the institutions in the in the advisors equivalent to ministry. Yeah. And also advisors equivalent to ministerial uh, rank, which has uh, I think we have about ten of them. And these are all making basically they are making the ministries redundant. I just want to show you uh, I won't bother you with too much detail, but I just want to show you, for instance, these are the agencies in the Prime Minister Department. The Maritime Ag Agency, Pengakwasan, Maritime Malaysia. You actually don't need to put them, put this in, in the Prime Minister Department. This is called APMM, or the Maritime Enforcement Agency. It can go to Transport Ministry, or it can go to, it can go to uh, the Home Ministry, or it can go to the Defence Ministry. It doesn't have to be in the Prime Minister Department. There's something called, uh, oh sorry, this is not in the first slide. Oh, sorry. There's something called a Bureau Pengaduan Awam. In many other countries, you have ombudsman. Ombudsman is outside of the government, a semi-independent agency handling complaints and investigations of public complaints. You don't actually need to put them in, in the Prime Minister Department. Um, you have something called Bureau Tata Negara, as pointed out by Anthony, is a waste of um, bloody waste of public money. Um, of course, the parliament shouldn't be in within the prime minister department. It should be it should be an independent body, but it is not. Uh, we have also number twenty, number twenty one. Uh, this is the LK, LPKP or the Commercial Vehicle Licensing Board of Sabah and Sarawak, which should be placed un, under the prime uh, under the Transport Ministry without having to be placed under here. And actually, SPAT is also under this. And for instance, you have Penasihat Science. How do you point? How do you do pointer? Yeah, Science Advisor. You have a Science Ministry. You have a Unit Innovasi Has. But we actually have a we have a you know Ministry of Innovation. Okay. Uh, there is a Ministry in charge of Felda. But there's there's also there's another okay there's a ministry in charge of Felda but there are two agencies responsible for Felda in the Prime Minister Department. Of course, the last one uh, you all know what it is, uh? <laughs> the Ministry of Rosma. <laughs> uh, yeah, Pemandu. Um, I think my view of Pemandu is well well recorded. Uh, from the first day, I say in the first year, I already say Permandu is called Kementerian Idris Jala or Kija. I give it a, ma a name. I in 2009, I already called for the abolishment of Permandu. Um, Rasa did some work on the efficiency and the effectiveness of Permandu. We don't believe in superhero in government ministry. We believe that you have to have proper system. You need to build check and balance, and you need to build. Uh, system in each of the ministry and not actually have uh, permandu. Now I take this opportunity to call on the permandu, call on permandu to be abolished uh, with the departure of uh, Idris Jala as a minister. Idris Jala term as as senator ends in September. I think it's time for us to uh, close it down. See, um, Escom Escom could have been parked under the defense ministry or or under the home ministry. It doesn't have to be in the Prime Minister Department. Um, and of course, the last one, do you know how this last one came about? This is, not, this is called Jabatan Pertahanan Awam Malaysia, uh, Public Defense, Public Defense, uh, Civil Defense uh, 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 Department. Now, this was under Home Ministry until 28th of July. Why was it previously? I mean, it was under Home Ministry. It was always under Home Ministry, but suddenly it was moved here in order to give Shahidan Kasim a portfolio. After taking away Shahidan's portfolio from uh, handling Parliament, he handles now civil defence. Okay, this is a joke that we are we are reading about, and I just say that it is 
very important that we have to have this mindset shift that we, we treat democracy seriously and democracy is about respecting differences. Democracy is about ensuring check and balance and that has to start and that has to be from the parliament. Thank you.